to Rewild, where we talk about environment, psychology, and other interesting things. And today, as I promised in some previous videos that I've uploaded recently, I would like to share with you three different types of meditation practice that I think have some pretty sound research behind them with respect to what we know about the human mind and what their specific benefits um, are. So, and actually, correction, I, I think two of these have a lot of research, and I'll go ahead and try to link some of that below, um, but one of them, I'm not too sure, and I'll kind of explain why and some of the nuances with that, but why I still think it's worth looking into. So, one of the things that I think people don't always uh, I, I don't think people really take meditation very seriously in our society. <clears throat> in the West, where I'm recording this, or like in America, I think there's a little bit of a implication that, you know, meditation belongs in some regards to uh, more Eastern cultures. And I've, I've even heard people, you know, maybe imply that, that like that doesn't belong to us. Something that I think is kind of interesting with respect to that is the fact that meditation, like meditative mind states, do, I think, exist in all cultures. And when we look at things like mindfulness practices and just being in the moment, if you've heard that phrase before, I think that they're very, very neurologically similar in terms of how they affect our mind state. Some people in uh, my graduate program had brought up beliefs that some folks have that um, meditation is a more masculine art form than feminine, and they had tied this through anthropologic research, um, kind of implying that men in ancient societies went hunting more, where women would be doing more like crafts, you know, like maybe weaving or um, in Hawaii pounding poi. I don't really know if that's fair. Um, I'm just mentioning it, that it's something I've heard before. I feel like for a lot of things like that, it's very speculative. Um, not all cultures have that type of division of labor. Many did. Um, but for example, in Hawaiian culture, men often did these types of more uh, like active eye-hand coordination or um, physical building and arts and crafts kind of tasks or cooking or things like that. Men cooked in Hawaiian society, for example. So sometimes the cliches we have about gender roles and how it affects the mind or anything um, in our physiology, I, I, don't, I don't think it's safe to think of them in a definitive way. But I did think that, you know, it's worth mentioning on the off chance if you are a woman or really like another type of brain that very much has difficulty sitting down in one place that you can access these types of meditative states in motion as well. So I'll give you an example. There was a researcher who wrote about flow state, and I am not going to butcher his name. I've never known how to say his name properly. Um, I think it's like an Eastern European fellow, and it starts with C, like Chris Mahaley. Ah, I tried. Okay. So, but I'll go ahead and link um, his research on flow state. I've been reading his book off and on for the last year or two, just kind of digesting it. It's not, the book itself, I, I think, I'll, I'll be frank, I don't really think it's necessary to read his direct writings unless you're deeply interested in it. You can get access to the concept of flow state, you know, organically through YouTube videos like this or um, research other people have written so far, I would say. And I think like many things, um, especially like in indigenous culture, some things are, they exist before like your typical science guy coins a term for them, right? Like I think enlightenment, for example, has probably existed before we have like a conceptual idea of what that meant and like a word for it. I think that flow state is something that's quite universal that probably exists in all cultures and doesn't just belong to this particular researcher, although he did um, write extensively about this and dedicated his life to that concept. And I think that the concept of flow state is very similar to 
what was sort of being said about the genders with respect to the idea that sitting still, staring into space for hours at a time or minutes at a time was a skill set that a hunter would uh, develop more readily or, or, you know, the brain would start to, like, conform itself that way if you were a hunter. Um, so for people who may not resonate with that, I, I just want to acknowledge that sitting in one place is not necessary to heal the mind through mindfulness techniques. And sometimes things like weaving or uh, going for a mindful walk, um, you know, going on walkabout or, uh, I think in Japanese, shashu, it might be. I might be, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, there are forms of walking meditation. In Japan, I think there's also a term called forest bathing when you go into nature, which can have like really, really good effects on the mind. So that was, that's kind of my long <laughs> introduction to just the, I, I think it's important to think about meditation in these more global and nuanced terms because there are a lot of people when they hear oh you should meditate more they go I, I can't do that I've got ADHD I can't sit still I'm not gonna meditate um and frankly I I'm like that too and I've also had very disciplined meditation practice eras of my life that were life-changing and there is an old um saying I think in the Zen community, that if you don't have time to meditate, you, you should meditate 20 minutes a day, they say, which I don't do as I'm recording this right now. I'm being a hypocrite. Um, well, actually, I kind of do, um, but not like in the typical, you know, sit on your pillow, light a candle kind of way. Um, I, I sauna now, which, you know, I try to keep a quiet mind when I do that, and I think it's similar, but um the, the adage goes, you know, that you should be meditating 20 minutes a day um, in Zen Buddhism, I believe. And if you don't have time, they say, you should then meditate an hour a day. And I love that. You know, those of us who are part of that community all um, get a chuckle out of that because time is an illusion and our perceptual awareness of our capacity to let time flow is... Um, kind of dictated by how healthy our minds are or how much we've cultivated minds that can process the world that way. In, uh, I believe, certain Mesoamerican cultures in indigenous communities, I read this in the book The Four Agreements. It's, I think it's in the intro of The Four Agreements. They talk about this thing called like the Thousand Voices or the many multitudes of voices. And the thousand voices, I think, is like a metaphor for that kind of disquieted mind. You know, we've all had these experiences where maybe we've been doom scrolling a lot or channel surfing like cable TV or something. Um, or maybe worse, we're watching cable TV while we doom scroll, right guys? Like, have you seen like, you know, sometimes younger kids or like very wired people will have like three different screens in front of them all at once and that kind of stuff. Um, literally it, it causes like symptoms very similar to ADHD when you're very um kind of like in a very distraction prone environment the brain becomes ap uh, acclimated to that and then it can become difficult to focus because of um I would say like a dopamine addiction is what some people describe it as where there's this thing called a dopamine detox which I'm not really going to recommend to you folks unless it really speaks to you personally <laughs> because it's boring and that's the point. Um, and I don't like meditation. I think sometimes this stuff's not very realistic uh, for us to, I don't really know, like, like you, you can't just jump into that unless your soul has a yearning for it because it's just an uncomfortable thing to do. It reminds me of like people who do stuff like naked and afraid or alone or people who go on like weird wilderness survival expeditions like it's not like a normal person activity it's putting yourself through like a strange uncomfortable challenge in order to like fortify your sense of spirit um Wim Hof people those guys who want to like bathe in ice buckets you know to help their 
consciousness and immune system. Wim Hof cracks me up. I hate the cold and I'm never going to be a Wim Hof disciple. Lord, like I, I <laughs> but I respect it. Like I respect that um, sort of like I, I get a kick out of it. You know, that's a type of like personal torture, a uh, feat of physical prowess and mental and physical training that I'm, I'm personally not interested in. So I want to say the same for things, um, frankly, like meditation. I think meditation is a little bit similar to this and definitely things like dopamine detoxes that are kind of all similar wrapped in the burrito of um, ADHD environmental stressors and exacerbators and the difficulty of cultivating a mindfulness or a meditation practice we are all very overstimulated in our society, and it's been getting worse because of how wired we are. Um, there's a, a fair amount of research about this out there. You can, you know, you can just pop up Google, Google Scholar and see on um, a lot of the people who invent these devices and you know the software for our social media do not allow their children to use it um, at certain ages until they get older, and we need to you know, kind of digest that as a society, <laughs> you know, that like, if like tech guys who invented the stuff don't want their kids on it until they're older, we certainly shouldn't be letting our children be um, glued to screens, you know, too atrociously. I'm one to talk. I'm definitely a very like screen oriented person. And I think that's why I teach stuff like this, because I'm impacted by it and I've had like a long journey of trying to heal my mind and kind of thinking of this stuff almost like an addiction. You know, I think a lot of us consume media in an addictive way. And one of the reasons I'm just recording this as a podcast format today is because um, <laughs> I had a schedule and a deadline to meet and I just uh, have been having like a restful kind of sick week and I don't feel like putting on makeup or setting up cameras, um, the quality of my camera in my last recordings, you guys have probably seen it, could use a little bit of work, um, and I got one that came in the mail, but I need, I need a week or two to, like, set it up, um, and the other, like, more wholesome reason, aside just from, like, life logistics, is we stare at screens too much, you know, and so I am a little bit curious, um, let me know if you're listening to this, or if you've consumed other content I've created, how you feel about podcast format. I know like algorithmically it doesn't do as well on YouTube because it's like a visual format, but I think since the pandemic, a lot of us have been switching more to audio media so we can kind of break away from screens and, you know, fold our laundry, <laughs> um, clean our homes and just kind of, or go for a walk in nature when we think about and consume media and give our eyes a break. So, um, and that's kind of a little tangent, uh, but I'll, I'll be doing this once in a while um, if I have something to put out there into the world, but want to just kind of like keep it, keep it simple. Um, and I, I hope that people take that advice too, to kind of like go uh, find ways to take breaks from excessive screen time. I think beyond six hours for work and something like beyond two hours a day for leisure there starts to show like significant cognitive decline in terms of like the brain's ability to process and like the negative effects we see from internet and um, other types of screen usage. So that was a bit of a tangent, but not really in the sense that like when I hear people popularly saying, oh, I can't meditate, I hate meditating, I don't want to sit still, my mind is too busy. It's like, well, yeah, that's the point. Like that, that's just, that means you really need to. It's similar to somebody becoming very tired and fatigued as a result of inactivity physically. You know, um, if you are a very sedentary person, which, you know, um, <laughs> a lot of internet addicts are too, right? Um, people who are addicted to screens get so engrossed in the screen that they forget to move their bodies sometimes, I, myself included. Um, you know, if you stop doing a lot of physical activity over time, your body will become very sore. And it's kind of counterintuitive because we think of the body as being sore from, you know, working out from uh, muscle soreness in a good way, you know, or if you strain muscles from working out too much, but you can also become sore from not working out enough. And it, it kind of reminds me of that, like if somebody says, I can't work out, I'm too sore because their body has suffered, you know, literal atrophy, right? You know, the body is so 
tired from not moving enough, but it's it's not thriving and it's not happy and it disincentivizes you from getting out of that rut, right? I, I feel like that's a perfect analogy for the I can't meditate camp or I've never been able to, it's, it's too much. And I don't want to sound too harsh with this. I just want people to realize that, um, especially for those of us in the West who don't come from cultures that have a lot of meditation education also those of us who are addicted to like hyper media you know and like these seven second screen clips when we watch a movie um that have been getting shorter and shorter all the time um of course you don't think meditation's easy <laughs> you know like because that part of you know, the ability to be in flow state, the ability to be mindful, the ability to be in the moment, to focus on one thing at a time and not have a dopamine addiction has been hampered by your environment. So that's why to me it's like all the more reason meditation is so important. Um, and again, like I, I feel kind of hypocritical because I, I personally don't do enough. Um, my ideal number, and I think everybody's different, but just for a guidepost so you guys can kind of see like the human ratio and like the human flaw of like this practice could be for somebody who has kind of come in and out of it or like come into learning about it as an adult is like 40 minutes a day. If I meditate for 40 minutes a day, I'm, I'm a completely different person. It's really bizarre. Um, I think more clearly. I handle stress better. I'm more in tune with my body physically, like I know what my body needs more, it helps with everything, weight, sleep, relationships, uh, work ethic, work productivity, happiness, just that feeling of calm and peace. Do I meditate for 40 minutes a day right now in my life? No. <laughs> like, I really don't, and like maybe after recording this I should, I should go make good on that because it's just kind of one of those things that you know in the back of your mind as life ebbs and flows. Um, but I do try to do at least 20, um, a majority of days, and I don't beat myself up if, you know, that doesn't always happen. And I will do things like a five-minute meditation whenever the hell, if I think that my brain is just feeling too busy. Like, I, I've learned because of my meditation practice, even though I'm not, like, at the pinnacle of that in my life era right now, I am better able to tell if my brain has like gone into hyperdrive. Um, I'm a Fitbit user. I kind of enjoy tech like that here and there. And there was some people were like noticing that their fitness trackers actually can like record panic attacks and things like that. And sometimes like this new like wearable health tech will alert you if it senses that, you know, maybe you need to calm down. Like, if it can sense your vitals and your limbic system being really accelerated without any, like, physical reason for it, um, that it looks like a, a mental thing, it'll warn you, you know, hey, do you want to do a breathing exercise or something like that? And, you know, it's kind of beautiful and sad, right, that, like, some of us are so disconnected from our bodies that we don't even know <laughs> without, like, a robot telling us, hey, like, hey, you're having a panic attack, you know, you want to sit down and breathe for a while. Um... So for me, I, I can say that even though I'm not at the top of my meditation game um, in this moon of my life, uh, I, I do have like permanent benefits from my meditation practice, like a better capacity to know my body, to know if I'm feeling anxiety, I've noticed uh, I'm a lot more self-aware and I, I can tell like if I'm off. Uh, another friend of mine is a yoga teacher and he had said the same thing about um, <laughs> he, he had taught like yoga for years and had a friend who was like, damn you, you, you made it. So I can't do yoga. I, I can't survive without yoga every day because now that I know yoga, I can tell when I'm, my body's out of alignment. And so it's like this level of self-awareness that is just like heightened. Um, yoga is a really neat thing that I kind of want to talk more about as well, which is technically, I believe a form of meditation in motion and um we'll get into that in a little bit I feel like I set out to talk about the three types of meditation I recommend and um 20 minutes has already gone by so I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of wrap this up like catch a little break and I think I'm gonna post the three types of meditation that I recommend for um people starting out who are curious 
uh, I recommend all types of meditation as, as long as it's not hurting you or others. I, I don't know how many diverse forms there are out there, but the three that I recommend are ones that I've done myself, which is um, Maitri, Kundalini, and um, Zazen meditation. And again, those are all from Eastern cultures too. So I, I think there's a good case to be made that the Eastern world has um, probably like the deepest like language and um, depth in that that's like a uh, mainstream that we know of uh, that I've been taught. Um, but it's life-changing stuff, and I, I want to go into like the nuances of how those different types of meditation affect the brain um, from kind of a more Western scientific perspective, what my assumptions are about them, and then some of the biases we see in how modern research around meditation has been conducted so far and like what I would like to see in the research in the future. And also just to give you guys like a little bit of a taste in case you wanted to start a meditation practice, but you don't know where to start. Most people are given Zazen, um, also known as mindfulness meditation. Some people will debate that Zazen and mindfulness are the same. Personally, I think that they're similar enough that they could essentially be considered the same. Um, and I'll explain why in the next one. I think I'm going to do like a part one and a part two of this. Um, so this is a, a little introduction, just um, getting people prepared to learn about meditation and kind of hopefully breaking down some of the biases people have to learning a new skill that um, that learning process might be a little bit clunky in the beginning because it's so desperately needed. So thank you so much for listening to this and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care.